Hi all. In chapter 2, we learned about the basics of chemistry. Last week, in chapter 3, we learned about the basics of cell structure and function. Now, in chapter 4, we begin to put these parts together into biochemical systems that accomplish the functioning of the cell. The term metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions that take place inside cells. In the human body, made of 30 trillion cells, that's a whole lot of reactions. Even a unicellular bacterial cell performs an extraordinary range of chemical reactions during its life. To make our discussion of metabolism more manageable, we'll focus on a subset of chemical reactions in the life of a cell, those that are involved in the acquisition and use of energy. This is a picture of a cute hummingbird. That's it. Just a cute hummingbird. Uh, okay, we could see that it's feeding from a hummingbird feeder. That hummingbird feeder is filled with a sugary solution that mimics the nectar that flowers produce. Somehow, the hummingbird is able to drink that sugary solution and use it as an energy source for the thumping of its heart and the beating of its wings. This begs the question, what is energy? Our book defines energy as the ability to do work or create change. We can further refine that definition of energy by defining work as movement. So we'll use this definition. Energy is the ability to make things move. All organisms take in external resources and convert those resources into usable energy. Most organisms get that energy from sunlight, either directly, producers like plants, or indirectly, consumers like us and decomposer microorganisms. There are some organisms that live around deep hydrothermal vents that make use of high energy resources coming from the Earth's core rather than from the sun, but these are pretty rare. One of the concepts that frames this flow of energy is called the first law of thermodynamics. The first law is also known as the law of conservation of energy. It states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be converted from one form to another. The sun slams hydrogen atoms together to form helium atoms. In this process, a considerable amount of energy is released. Most all of the organisms on our planet make use of this release of energy from helium production. We don't generate our own energy. We have what the sun provides and what is present in the materials that make up the earth but we can convert that limited supply of energy from one form to another. That is the basis for all the energy metabolism that we'll discuss in the rest of this chapter. Whatever organisms we're looking at, those organisms perform many chemical reactions to build their structures and to store and use energy. We can categorize chemical reactions into two large groups, anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions. Anabolic reactions are building reactions, where smaller molecules are connected together to form larger products. We'll give an example of an anabolic reaction that we discussed in Chapter 2. Anabolic reactions usually require energy, and the products of anabolic reactions usually store more energy than were in the original reactants. Catabolic reactions are breakdown reactions. They involve taking a larger molecule and breaking it down into smaller products. Catabolic reactions usually result in the liberation of energy. That liberated energy can be used to power other functions or reactions. This coupling of catabolic reactions, which liberate energy, to drive anabolic reactions, which require energy, is typical of how organisms build and maintain their bodies. In the next video, we'll take a look at some of the specifics of the bioenergetics that are characteristic of chemical reactions.